What are you working on? Stick to that question and you'll be good. Don't show your lunch or your latte, show your work. Austin Cleon. So this book, Show Your Work by Austin Cleon, persuaded me to record this, my first YouTube video, and I'm gonna explain why that is. So I read a lot of books, but nowhere near as many books as YouTube videos I watch. My primary source when I want to learn about something or understand more about something is definitely going straight to YouTube. I really enjoy having something explained to me by a person kind of like almost face to face in this kind of setup. So if I'm interested in something, YouTube is always the place I go first to learn about it. And if a certain YouTuber recommends a book, then I'm more likely to give that book a try. Now this book was a recommendation that I found on YouTube and it's an excellent recommendation for me to pass on to someone else, namely because it's so short. This book takes about an hour to read and the value you can get from that one hour in terms of the insights that it provides are actually amazing. So Austin Cleon argues that sharing your work online or having an online presence that reflects your interests is one of the most beneficial and rewarding things that you can do in sort of 21st century life. And one of the things he's trying to advocate for in this book is that this should not only be the preserve of kind of elite social media influencers or established recording artists or filmmakers or painters, etc, etc. It should be for everyone. Sharing your work in a sort of semi-serious way should be something that we all try to explore at some point in our lives. The first question that this book raised for me is, don't we already do this? I mean, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, now TikTok, etc, etc, are all platforms that have made each and every one of us our own sort of micro creator. We're all micro vloggers now on Instagram, we're all amateur photographers, some of us are even amateur dancers on TikTok nowadays, and we all write micro blogs on Twitter and Facebook, we all share our opinions on one social platform or another almost constantly, but none of us take the time to really delve into that more seriously and make it a more formal thing. It's more seen as a kind of throwaway act that we just repeat on a daily basis. But even though we all dabble in photography, videography, writing, etc, etc, using these platforms, not many of us take the step to make it more serious or to formalise this into a piece of content that we kind of share with pride, honestly and openly, something that we are proud of and that we want to give out to the world. Um, and I started to wonder why this is. So the first kind of paradigm that I looked at after I'd read this book was consumption versus creation. Why is it that we are so keen to consume high level content that's taken hours and hours to make by a professional and yet we're so happy to create or to churn out very low level content all the time? Most of us don't take a great deal of time when we craft our Instagram story or when we take a photo of our avocado based lunch at the weekend and yet the things that we want to consume, uh, be it Netflix, be it YouTube, be it something else, are, have usually been crafted by someone who is an expert filmmaker, expert photographer, expert writer. So this was the first thing that was persuasive to me in terms of uh, persuading me to create something for myself. Consumption versus creation. Do we have the balance right in our lives between the amount of media that we consume and what we then create and put back into the world? If we do nothing but consume and consume and consume content and media and input all the time, is that a healthy way for us to be living? Is that a satisfying way for us to go through life? And I've been finding that I consume a lot, especially YouTube, Instagram, etc, etc, but I don't really give anything back. I have no time to process what I've learned and put it back out in my own format. So this consumption versus creation balance is really important if you want to sort of um, have a positive relationship with the 21st century media that is all around us. If you think about the human body, it runs on batteries, the batteries being the food that we eat. And therefore, in order to conserve energy, our brain will always find the path of least resistance to doing something. The thing that takes the least mental energy will be the pattern that we are most likely to fall into most of the time. And consumption of media is that pattern. It is that path of least resistance. The thing that's easiest for us to do is just to receive dopamine hits from content that other people have made, let that stimulus wash over our brain and never take the time to think and process and produce something back into the world. And this is how we find ourselves following the same mental models over and over and over again instead of innovating or being creative. Innovating, being creative, creating something original for yourself is quite an exhausting and difficult mental process, especially compared to the sort of passive consumption of media that surrounds us in our current epoch on this planet. So we have consumption, we have creation, but Austin Cleon brings in a third element to this equation, which is collaboration. Cleon points to some of the most respected and renowned artists, painters, writers, filmmakers of the last few hundred years, 
and tries to dispel the myth of what he calls the lone genius, i.e. the idea that those people are sort of squirreled away in a cave somewhere, just creating, creating, never engaging with the outside world, and then they emerge from the cave with this masterpiece that the whole world kind of revels at and thinks is extraordinary. He says that instead of this lone genius model, what happens in most cases is in fact what he calls a senius, i.e. a scene of people collaborating and working together, sharing ideas, discussing things, coming up with their ideas in a more collaborative fashion. The first example of this that came to my mind was the Bloomsbury group, people like John Maynard Keynes, Virginia Woolf and others who used to eat together, party together, share their work together and spend long afternoons and evenings discussing their ideas. Even though they worked in different disciplines, by the sheer fact of sharing their work and their ideas with others, they were able to collaboratively produce a body of work that was extraordinary for the time and that we still reflect upon today. I also think about some of my favourite writers from the late 20th century who were in a group doing similar things. Ian McEwan, Christopher Hitchens, Martin Amis, Salman Rushdie and a group of other writers all used to spend social time together and to collaborate on each other's work, write for each other's magazines, review each other's work and discuss the things they were working on all the time. They were in fact not lone geniuses producing this work, they were part of a scene of people who together came up with extraordinary works of art and creativity. The big difference between those times and now is the internet. So of course we all have our own friendship groups locally to where we live, who we spend our physical time with, but what the internet allows you to do is connect with people who have the same interests, hobbies or passions anywhere in the world and create your own seniors online. It's not necessary for the people who you socialize with in real life to share all of your interests. Not all of my friends share all of my interests. Of course they share some. We're not gonna have a completely aligned profile of interests and hobbies and passions and opinions. And the internet provides the opportunity for every single person on this planet who has an internet connection to create their own seniors, their own realm in which they share the things they're passionate about and begin to improve. So Austin Cleon goes on to talk about the principal objections that people have to sharing their work online or to sharing their own voice or opinions on the internet. The first one is, I have nothing interesting to share. This myth is something that I've often thought about in the past. I've always envisaged doing something that involved creativity or producing something of my own. But I've also always had that doubt that I have nothing original to share, nothing that breaks the mold and nothing that hasn't already been made to a better standard somewhere else on the internet or in the wider world. But what Austin Cleon says is that each of us has a unique set of experiences, a unique combination of interests, life experiences and things that have happened to us that make our perspective valuable. Now, this is interesting the more you think about it because nobody has the exact same combination of life experiences, family background, friendship groups, uh, or personal thoughts and internal monologues that you have. And if you draw your creativity from your own set of experiences, then you can create something that is unique and is original. Admittedly, at first, it can be by repurposing other people's content, like this video you're watching now is about me repurposing a book that I read. But you don't find your own voice and your own unique perspective by saying nothing and contributing nothing. Everybody has to start somewhere. The next objection is simply, I'm not good enough at X. Now this is a really, really stupid one, but we all struggle with this in our own way. If you're someone who's always been interested in poetry, the fact that your first poem doesn't turn out like a W.B. Yeats poem should not discourage you from continuing to learn. And learning in public is something that really, really provides accountability for us, provides the opportunity for feedback for us, and documenting your honest journey through getting better at something is something that other people can be very, very interested in and something that can give other people inspiration, can give other people pause for thought. It's an opportunity for people to give you input and teach you or give you a perspective that you weren't necessarily thinking about. Now, the first time you go to the gym, you're not going to pull a world record deadlift on your very first try, but nobody would argue that that means you should never start working out. The fact that you're not the best at something or that somebody better exists out there already should not prevent you from starting anything if it's something you're passionate about. I've always had the idea that reflecting on the things that I read and watch online is something that I would enjoy to do. My jobs recently allowed me to develop my filmmaking and editing skills, so why not begin to share my opinions online in a format that I enjoy watching myself, i.e. YouTube videos? The fact that my first video will not be the best video that YouTube has ever received as an upload should not discourage me from beginning a process if it's something that I'm interested in. And having a goal that's based on comparison with others is something we've all been told a million times by a million different people that we shouldn't be doing. Another key theme in Austin Cleon's book is fear of judgment and failure. I don't know if you've noticed, but during the sort of early 2020, early COVID-19 period, lots and lots of people that I knew were starting secondary Instagram accounts, secondary hobby-based social media accounts about the things that they've been doing with their free time. And watching them develop and grow their hobby was something that I always found really, really interesting. 
And there's a secondary narrative there that I noticed about the other friends that I have. I think it's a really interesting social experiment to see when a friend or a mutual acquaintance starts a new hobby and shares it online, especially on social media, have a look at which friends are encouraging of that and which friends sort of sneer and mock that endeavor because the person's first picture or video or contribution wasn't polished or perfect. It wasn't a professional standard in whatever they've chosen to do. I think it tells you a lot about the people who are encouraging and supportive compared with the people who want to sort of denigrate and bring down those people. I think most of us want to share our passions with the world in one format or another, be you an introvert, extrovert, whether you want to do it online or through a different format. Most of us want to share our passions and our interests with people who are interested in the same thing. And people who look down on that process, I think maybe could be masking their own insecurity about not being able to follow the same path. So with all that being said, there are plenty of psychological obstacles to stop a person sharing their work online. But if you have an interest in something, I don't see the reason why you should not start today in sharing it in some format that interests you. I've always enjoyed discussing things that I've read or things that I've been thinking about with others. And I've also recently been learning filmmaking. So the idea of combining those two into recording YouTube videos is something that really, really interested me. Now, of course, I have the same psychological hurdles of not being the best at making videos right now. Maybe no one's interested in what I have to say. Maybe I still need to discover my niche or my voice or what I want to do. But the most important step is the very first one. And this video was the very first step. So if you wanna see more videos about books that I have been reading, podcasts I've been listening to, or other things that I've been diverting my attention, subscribe to this channel below, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Thank you.